Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for coming by on this cold evening. We appreciate it. Uh, tonight's event is brought to you by the Digital Theory Humanities Lab, working in collaboration with the NYU AD Institute in New York. We owe special thanks to the lab's originators, Leif Weatherby, who's here over here, and Marion Thane, who's in London, and we'll view this by, on the video afterwards, as well as to the former Dean of Humanities, Giorgino Dopico, and the Bennett Polanski Foundation that provides funding. Thanks also to Ralph Raymond of the AD Institute for his meticulous support in planning this event. Our speaker tonight, Peter Debola, is Professor of Cultural History and Aesthetics at King's College, Cambridge, and the head of the Cambridge English faculty. Since the start of the millennium, he has published four monographs and two major collections. Starting with Art Matters, Harvard University Press in 2001, to the Education of the Eye, Painting, Landscape, and Architecture in 18th Century Britain, Stanford 2003, Peter has explored a wide range of topics from the 4th of July and the founding of America to most recently 2013's The Architecture of Concepts, The Historical Formation of Human Rights. That book began Peter's ongoing and very successful venture into computation and the digital. As Jonathan Israel wrote in a review and in critical inquiry, the architecture of concepts is a major contribution to historical methodology, as well as to enlightenment studies and our understanding of how modern universal human rights arose. By means of a systematic digital study based on the entire spread of 18th century English texts, of the shifts of the way key phrases and terms orbit around other key phrases and terms, Debola has produced a fully convincing and highly innovative conclusions. Peter took his next innovative step by launching the Cambridge Concept Lab as the first scholarly enterprise of that university's Center for Digital Knowledge. That lab has constructed pioneering computational and visualization tools for exploring concepts in a digital environment, tools that will now be available to the public through the Cambridge University Library. Today, he continues his, his exploration of the nature and consequences of the digital by asking how it has rewired politics. His talk tonight is titled, Politics in the Era of Emergent Hyperconnectivity. Please welcome Professor Pete Debola. Thank you, Cliff, for a uh, very generous introduction. I've just seen that the slide on the front of this left out the word emergent, which is... Yeah, it's arrived. In January 1991, the most significant technological revolution in human history occurred. No one noticed. No one predicted its very swift and deep effects. Now, as we turn the year 2019, we're only just beginning to see how deep and how powerful those effects have so far been. It remains the case, however, that our understanding of them is only rudimentary. Moreover, we can only at best guess what the future effects might be. That revolution happened the moment the World Wide Web was turned on. One of the most extraordinary aspects of this revolution is that millions of people across the globe, including you, perhaps some of you right now, are participating in it, in an ongoing experimental space that operates in continuous time. And although it might not be immediately apparent, your participation in this experimental space is vital to it. In fact, you and everyone else linked into the web provide the necessary input that drives this revolution. In some ways, and I'll get to this, this lack of awareness 
might just be <coughs> the single most extraordinary feature of this real-time experiment. We think we are just shopping or following our favorite celebrities, catching sports news, or accessing the day's weather forecast. Maybe we're just tweeting another message as we sit watching ourselves on the television. Maybe we're firing yet another attorney general. Most significantly, even when aware, we are largely unable to intervene in the continuous mutation of the experiment. At base, this revolution is an utter transformation in what being connected is, what it does. No wonder Mr. Zuckerberg uses this as the strapline for his rapacious monster. For most of us, connection across the platform of the web is primarily experienced as a one-to-one -one communication, say, between you and the provider of the services you're interested in. And of course, as you know, Tim Berners-Lee's amazing invention was effectively a new language or code that allows documents to be linked by what is called a communications protocol, HTTP, that allows our near at hand technology, a computer running the necessary software, to link up with far away and distant technologies, that is, any or all of the computational devices that are connected across the platform. These links, however, are decentralized and distributed across the structure. That is why we think of it as a web. Moreover, physical distance in this digital domain is inconsequential. Or to put that another way, space is a function of time. It's not distance as such that must be traversed across the platform. It is speed of connection. Thus, as he made his technological and computational leap, he also, knowingly or not, prompted a seismic shift in the structure of communication. Though we did not notice this at the time, almost silently, softly, and without friction, we've passed from the classical model of telecommunication in which information is exchanged one-to-one -one across distant locations to a new era in which communicative distance is a function of speed, turning the tele in telecommunication into something more powerful, almost instantaneous, near-continuous, one-to-all proxy communication. The moment I referred to January 1991, was not, as we now say, born digital. That is to say, the prehistory to the World Wide Web is fully within the analog world, even if digital technologies of many kinds were very well established by 1991. Although the revolution could not have happened without a number of key technologies, prime among them the exponentially increasing power of computation as the microchip enabled faster and larger processing of bits, the successful design and marketing of the desktop computer, the discovery and rapid exploitation of fiber optics, and most important of all, the creation of the internet. But it was not merely a summation of these technologies. While it is true that the net is a necessary component of the revolution, enabling all digital technologies, both present and future, to interconnect on a single platform, without the protocol of the web, its potential would, may, would, would remain largely unrealized. This protocol is based upon two very powerful principles that allows the architecture to function. Orthogonality and extensibility. You do not need to know the precise detail of how these principles determine programming protocols in order to grasp how they have enabled this extraordinary thing to operate. Orthogonality is the process by which distinct but connected entities may evolve independent of each other. And extensibility is the property of a technology that promotes evolution without losing interoperability. 
This is why the web can limitlessly scale up, why it does not break when many millions of documents per day are uploaded onto the platform. In the environment of the web, orthogonality and extensibility create an extraordinarily fecund engine for continuous transformation and mutation. There is, however, one more element within the architecture of the web that we need to consider if we are to understand something very significant for the argument I'm now going to explore with you. This is what in information theory and computation is called emergence, the property of a system for creating new entities that are greater than the sum of its individual parts. No one knew and certainly no one predicted in 1991 that this amazing invention would very rapidly, within 25 years, have the capacity to transform every social, commercial, and political transaction engaged in anywhere on the planet. I shall call this extraordinarily powerful technology emergent hyperconnectivity. And I'm going to refer to it throughout as a platform, a continuously altering structure that preserves its principles of operation. So the issue that I want to explore with you this evening is this. What does politics look like in the era of emergent hyperconnectivity? I suppose this might at first look like a redundant question. It looks a damn mess, you might say. Or, if you are by nature pessimistic, you might consider the current infection of politics by the banalities of tweeting as the end of democracy, or at least the end of rational democracy. Notwithstanding this, let's not immediately join cause with the countless barroom conversations that are doubtless happening right now in the village. So I'm going to begin with some frequently remarked features of what is broadly and perhaps not completely accurately called the digital revolution. I guess one would need to have been buried in the ground not to notice that huge swathes of human activity have already been transformed by digital technology in general and the World Wide Web in particular, to name just a handful, communication, access to information, transactions in any and every commodity, virtual or real, sociality, entertainment, hiring and firing public servants. Equally, one would have to live permanently trapped in a Wi-Fi dead zone to be unaware that recent political events across the globe from the Arab Spring to the election of your current president are deemed to be complicit, at the very least, with these same digital technologies. But for the most part, and certainly in the culture at large, attempts at understanding the role digital technology plays in both national and international politics have only considered the epiphenomena. I hesitate to say much more here since I do not live in the United States. But it seems to me that complaining about using digital platforms to target voters is like bemoaning the effects on voter behavior of the printing press or the postal system, not to mention the television and radio. What we really need is a far more informed analysis of how this powerful new technology of emergent hyperconnectivity alters the, the architecture of the concept of politics. That is, how it infects and causes mutations in the supporting structures of the idea of the political itself. As far as I can see, most current attempts at making sense of what has become known as post-truth politics fail to notice anything other than hysterical or exaggerated misapprehensions of a very significant cultural, social, and political shift. My first point, then, is that we need to understand how this technology invades areas of human activity, most especially social and political life, 
as an emergent form, transforming both itself, that's the technology, and the domains within which it operates. In order to gauge the significance of our current understanding deficit, let us first remind ourselves that politics in our standard ways of thinking it survives best in contexts that are information poor. Indeed, in some senses, the classical modes of political action are intended to exploit that fact and to control or restrict access to information. Now, with tardy hindsight, it's become very evident that politics alters in environments that are information rich or superabundant. So rich, in fact, that no single entity can ingest or process the continuous flow of information that is the signature of emergent hyperconnectivity, thereby making it far more difficult to operate perhaps the most important lever in the domain of politics, the ability to direct, restrict, and control information flows. This, as will become clearer in a while, requires us to retool our conception of politics in terms of the flow of information around an instable emergent system. Although we are stumbling towards a better grip on what is currently happening, we have yet to fully take account of the full force of my earlier observation about emergent systems. Let me repeat what I said a moment ago. The technology we have unwittingly unleashed transforms both itself and the domains in which it operates. This means that politics is also prey to the constant mutation that pro propels autopoetic emergent systems. The urgent question we are therefore faced with is this. Will such a transformation of politics be for humanity's good, or will it be for ill? You might think that one should approach this as one would approach all such doomsday rhetorical flourishes with a considered, well, it might be both. On the one hand, some have already proposed that this revolution has had beneficial effects. For citizens of this persuasion, the disintegration of politics, understood as the types or forms of government and representation that focus and implement collective action, is a net benefit. Others might note that such a disintegration of the common or collective has happened alongside the rise of the neoliberal subject. It has been at the cost of democratic polities. And these naysayers might also note that the advocates of the positive outcome have yet to map the consequences of this revolution with respect to the building blocks of the modern polis. Identity, property, social responsibility, representation, government, community, to name but a few. It may well turn out that a remodeling of these basic political concepts will indeed bring huge benefits to our shared social and political life. And I want to signal here right away that I am not of the Luddite party, which junks such idle speculation into the bin of techie utopianism. As good historians, we know that the idea of government or identity, for example, are not once and for all time ideas or ways for organizing and thinking about the individual and society. We've already had to recalibrate how we think of property within the context of the perfect reproducibility of digital media. Painful. Pardon? I don't have a slide. You'll get one in a minute. We've already had to recalibrate how we think of property within the context of the perfect reproducibility of digital media, painful as that was for the recording industry. It is a good thing, as far as I'm concerned, that the modes of continuous connection made available to us through current communications technology are forcing us to think hard about representation in the political sense and to consider ways in which individual participation morphs into crowd behaviors that are not simply aggregations of discrete 
individual acts. So if it is incontrovertible that the shapes and forms of politics are altering right now as we participate in the ongoing experimental space created by emergent hyperconnectivity, it should also be noted that as yet we have only rudimentary ways of intervening in these shifting practices. This is to say, we have as yet no means for controlling the infections of the digital within the political. And if you think Mr. Putin has a better idea, you are, I'm afraid, succumbing to the hype he wants you to believe. Our first task then is to ask if the digital technological infection of politics is creating an ontological transformation in the thing we call politics. What that means, the ontological transformation, is a change in the kind of thing that politics might be. I'm going to first address this large question from the side of optimism. Let us make a wager and say that the ontological transformation of politics might not only be beneficial, it might also be timely. A fully networked world potentially opens up resources, most obviously the crucial resource of information, to all citizens wherever they may be. You might reasonably remark that digital technologies are already transforming politics, enabling the growth or development of new kinds of association and, and, and empowering those who lack traditional forms of capital, wealth, social cachet or standing. But let's think about this for a moment. There can be no denying that for many citizens of the world, and their number increases continuously, the practice of daily life has been, become enmeshed in digital technology, and for many citizens, this comes as a form of enfranchisement. At the same time, these new digital, digital behaviors and practices have also begun to establish new forms of capital whose value is based upon the architecture of the platform. Scale of dissemination, for example, has created a new class of persons and person. Upon and within the web, you are, as it were, the size of your followers. Or, to give another example, one of the very real affordances of digital technology is its capacity to store and archive and then make rap rapidly accessible inhumanly digestible quantities of information. This creates an interesting human effect, the sense that we have the world's information at our fingertips as we sit at our laptops or punch at a mobile device, when of course it is the proprietary al algorithms which own and process the data. So if politics comprises the selective use of information for the purpose of gaining and wielding power, then our current digital technologies have massively enhanced the ability to do this. Hence, we find ourselves in the current maelstrom of arguments over who owns your data or has control over the technology that renders it usable. It might be worth here reminding ourselves that in 2013, five years ago, it was estimated that 60% of all devices on the internet exchanged data with Google's servers on any single day. Five years on, and that figure is likely to be so high as to be a protected species, which is coded speak for rendered invisible to us. These examples, however, suggest that nothing much about politics has changed in this connected world. It's just the very old fashioned form of politics based in the three C's that propelled the age of imperialism, copyright, capital, commerce. No wonder perhaps that many commentators see our current situation as a new scramble for terra incognita, the stupendous riches of aggregated massive information, the imperial age of massive data. So how can we better understand what I began with, the revolution that I referred to? We need, I think, to direct our attention away from the epiphenomena of political life 
in order to consider the deep structural effects, the alteration in DNA, if you will, that has occurred on account of the infection of the political by digital technology. We need to understand how information flows operate in an instable emergent system. And we can only do this if we, are, if we understand how the technology of emergent hyperconnectivity necessarily alters the underlying architectures of both the digital and the political. You will all help this happen the minute you leave this room and hook up online to see how your pension portfolio is doing or make that reservation at Frenchette. Ha. So, in the rest of this talk, I'm going to sketch out how three interlinked concepts operate in both domains, the digital and the political. In fact, they create the interface between them, and these are scale, the common, and participation. I'm going to argue that emergent hyperconnectivity significantly ramps up our capacities for occupying the spaces of the political, just as it simultaneously increases the number and type of such spaces, thereby transforming where politics happens and in the process creating a new political agency. I'm certain then that we are in fact in the midst of an ontological transformation of politics. What is the appropriate or workable scale for the political realm? One might begin by saying that scale in politics is everything. Its mechanisms and protocols for producing judgments and actions are well adapted, even best suited to the local. But scale in emergent hyperconnectivity has a very unusual feature. It is continuously recalibrated. What was today's global is tomorrow's local. This is because scale in emergent hyperconnectivity is its condition of emergence. Scaling up is the mechanism through which the new larger entity becomes more than the sum of its parts. In an analog environment, the calibration of scale has some purchase because it's possible to hold stable the criteria for comparing different things. This is larger, heavier, faster than that. But in an emergent system, the criteria for making such comparisons are corroded as it scales up. If we're, properly, if we're to properly grasp what is at stake in the move from an analog politics to a digital, if that is indeed what is transpiring, we must address the difficulty of using models or habits of thought well adapted to the analog that may be inappropriate for the digital. Say, the distinction I just made between the local and the global. Part of the problem then is how to deal with instable calibration or the continuous recalibration of the scale upon which the political operates. My screen has died. Um, uh, uh, oh, hello. <laughs> Technology suddenly goes on the blink. OK, thank you. Let's first consider this issue from the technical side by reminding ourselves about the fundamentals of the platform that I'm calling emergent hyperconnectivity. Remember, orthogonality and extensibility. I'm sure you can all recall um, the early days of browsing the web when hours, even days, were lost to the endless scrolling through search returns in an attempt to find something useful. We had yet to figure out how such a powerful platform could make use of the fact that every search inquiry has an identifier and therefore a trackable optimization success record. Once this became apparent, it was no longer necessary to search the entirety of the web, the billions of pages, every time we dialed in. It was merely enough to predict what would be useful to this search inquiry 
from past behavior. And hence, the beautiful structure in which optimization, success in finding the information we want, correlates with the number of times we dial up. The system needs you to connect and connect and connect. That is how it optimizes the utility of the platform for you. The effects of this in terms of our trust in the returns we get from our search queries have significant political ramifications. As we know, the primary source for information in the form of the news for many netizens is social media and its proprietary platforms. For the moment, I'm not concerned about whether or not it is news, we'll get to that in a minute, but to the structure of connectivity. The reason why we get hooked is that very fast and efficient algorithms target the information flows. And as each user inputs to the system, alterations occur not only to the values of the vectors within the system, but also to the relations between the vectors. In non-technical language, this means that your bid, quotation marks, for an apple at price X does not only alter the price of apples, it also restructures the Union Square market. If one is looking to purchase a taxi ride, the consequences of this technology give rise to perhaps predominantly old style or analog political issues. Not that we should ignore them for being so, such as employment conditions and security. But at present, there's only a rudimentary understanding of the political effects of being continuously hooked into the platform and its repetitive reinforcement of our senses of being me that is pr produced by this powerful targeting technology. The system creates hyper-individualized netizens. This, as I'll explain in a moment, presents us with a potential new political structure which contains only one person, a politics of the one. Thus, my first hypothesis regarding the alteration in the ontology of politics within the era of emergent hyperconnectivity is that participation within an emergent political system creates a new, larger, but also mutating entity that is me, the targeted individual whose sense of individuation is focalized and intensified through participation. Moreover, as you know, the targeting algorithms that track my insertion into the system reinforce my preferences or interests as they feed back the information I want. This effect, which has yet to become available for careful scholarly analysis and scrutiny on account of the proprietary nature of the data, might be called uber subjectivity. What has become openly evident, however, is that our participation in the platform of emergent hyperconnectivity corrodes our belief in truth. Truth is by necessity contingent. Although the platform of emergent hyperconnectivity operates in a state of continuous contingency, this does not mean that the contingent in the platform can be identified. It is a phantom. Contingency is both everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Think of it as a quantum property of the system. Put simply, there is no metric against which a statement's veracity can be measured because the state in which the system has coherence is constantly in movement. It's instable. Consequently, truth is impossible to establish. Paradoxically, in the networked environment of emergent hyperconnectivity, the effect of every input is contingent upon the configuration of the system immediately prior to its insertion, while at the same time, each input reconfigures the system. In relation to truth, this, mean that the, this means that these inputs construct their own truth conditions, or to put that in terms of the paradox I just invoked, they're contingent upon the impossibility of establishing contingency. 
This means that all truths become a new kind of entity in the platform, which is neither true nor false. It is truth-like. That is, truth-like, not truth-light, though it might also be that. This is a very complex and destabilizing philosophical and technological phenomenon, which creates the conditions of possibility for the establishment of what is popularly known as fake news. Here the president is, alas, all too right. Emergent hyperconnectivity creates truth-like statements as a function of its systemic, transformative, or autopoietic architecture. I think it has recently become clear how corrosive this is, but we have as yet no good idea about how to deal with it. This is to note that calls for, say, a regulatory body that would authenticate information as so-called true or would vouch for the accuracy of such information is analog thinking applied to an analog problem. It assumes that we can establish and maintain the distinctions between the true and the false in an instable information environment. It fails to appreciate what it means to say that fake news is a function of the system, not a product. We also need to address the significant alterations in temporality that take place in contemporary computational systems. In recent times, we've focused closely on the effects of big data and the statistical methods that give considerable weight to correlations rather than causations. But at the opposite end of the spectrum, computation also takes place at microscopic levels. In an electronic operating system, time is elided into speed. The system's capacity to process information is determined by the rate of flow of energy between components. Time, in this case, is microscopically segmented to such an extent that now, with the physical advances in processing power that arise on account of the efficiency of new materials or new working environments for old materials, multiple computations can be executed simultaneously. It is an astonishing fact that the new iPhone XS, for example, is capable of running up to five trillion operations per second in its so-called neural engine. Speed here alters the classical framework within which we conceptualize time, and these amazing technolo technological advances create the conditions in which parallel time worlds are routinely layered upon each other. What would it mean for politics to operate in such a temporally multi-structured environment in which agentiality might operate in an instable multiverse? Heretofore, we've generally modeled political behavior on the assumption that views, opinions, desires, objectives, and the realization of ideals can all be held in common. Politics emerges from the actions and the beliefs of the many. Digital technologies, however, and our participation in autopoetic systems that operate on the platform of the World Wide Web reconfigure the political commons. Fifteen or more years ago, this was seen by many early adopters of digital technologies as an unambiguous good. It was claimed back then that the internet would become a new and more powerful democratic space, essentially giving universal access to a universal demos. Now we know that this was, alas, a utopian dream. But not for the reasons that are commonly offered, which identify access to the platform as the major issue. This, once again, is to invoke analog politics as a solution to a digital problem. The real reason is because the scale of the web and the modalities of our participation in it militate against the establishment of the common. As we've seen, the utility of the algorithms that make navigation of its billions of pages workable is directly correlated with their targeting. The algorithm is for you. In part, this is why Google's invention of its search environment called PageRank is so seductive. The billions of bits of information accessible on the web are sorted so as to be relevant to this inquiry, 
to me. In the realm of politics, as we know it, however, such hyper-individualism corrodes our investments in the common. Thus, it turns out that contrary to what one might at first assume, universal access to a continuously emergent system makes the establishment of the common very difficult, if not impossible. A million posts from citizens do not aggregate in an analog form in emergent hyperconnectivity. They continuously re-engineer the interactive environment of the digital platform into a shifting set of nodes and edges. And in order to make this constantly mutating network usable, we've designed our access to it as a set of protocols that target the output of information as intensely personalized, as most useful to a single person. The system, however, works at such scale that it renders the individual invisible. What you will see or experience the moment you reconnect your surveillance device in your pocket is an intensification or reaffirmation of your agency, while at the same time, what the algorithm sees or registers is one more, in itself, insignificant data point. This militates against the political as a shared enterprise built upon generally held beliefs or ideals, because each intervention on the platform or insertion into emergent hyperconnectivity has the capacity to recalibrate the in interconnections between the entities which populate the system. While this might look like as if, excuse me, while this might look as if many views, the views of all of us, of every individual, are allowed to blossom, thereby realizing in some form a type of utopian participatory democracy which would be impossible in an analog world. In point of fact, this is just wishful thinking. Here we encounter another paradox that has a very seductive outline. Emergent hyperconnectivity continually produces a halo effect, the asymptotic mirage of total universal connectivity. But as I've noted, the operating platform continuously reconfigures its connections so as to disable the possibility of every entity within the system being connected to every other one. It's a mirage or fantasy of a universal human one-to-all connectivity because such total connection exists, as the, exists only as the horizon of possibility within the system. This is the genius of the Facebook model which allows me to choose my friends or to determine who are the many in my one-to-many connections. Once more, our attempts thus far at modeling or describing the operation of this platform in terms of smaller communities into what have become known as echo chamber subcultures, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> into echo, uh, become known as echo chamber subcultures or filter bubbles of like-mindedness misapply analog models to the architecture of hyper-connectivity. It's perhaps unsurprising that we reach to such models when we consider how powerful the sense of communicating within a restricted network is. But as we know, this is how it appears to us, the user, not the system itself, which aggregates and inspects all inputs, essentially continuously attempting to connect every data point across the network. As I'm sure you know, the most recent innovation on the platform, Facebook platform called Portal, in the words of its software engineers and marketing teams is, I quote, designed to make you feel closer to family and friends. That's exactly it. Designed to make you feel closer, not be closer. This is to register the remarkable power these targeting algorithms have to create a credible sense of our participation in the communities of our choice. But these effects are the opioids of continuous online connectivity that conspire to hide from view the digital architecture that operates across and within the platform. Let us recall that the chaos of superabundant information that is the World Wide Web is only rendered legible at the moment when an input in the form of a search query occurs, and at this very moment the system moves from stability to instability, and back again from the unstable to the stable. 
And remember that the speed and scale of the system allows this to happen at rates that are genuinely beyond human modes of calibration. Because of this, the legibility of the World Wide Web is predicated upon the singular and unique moment at which a new insertion or query occurs. That is an access request which immediately reconfigures the system. Furthermore, it cannot work without such inputs. It needs your search inquiry or Facebook post which is why the Facebook mission statement is an exhortation to connect. This is often taken as a shorthand for Facebook's business model, which, as you know, monetizes its data harvesting. But it's not simply that. It's also a conceptual technological model. If we see this in terms of the subjectivity effects it powerfully creates, it's no surprise that the revolution I pointed to at the start goes hand in hand with, or may even be the driver for, the emergence of the neoliberal subject. So let me return to my opening question. Is this an unavoidable or inevitable demise of politics as the common and shareable aims of the many? Or is it possible that we may be at a transition moment in which the ontology of politics is about to change? I'm going to answer this by sketching out how participation in the guise of hyper-individualism may be able to establish a politics in common. Modern democracies are often held up as the best political structures for enabling the participation of the many. One might first assume then that the open architecture of the World Wide Web and low-cost access to the digital technologies that propel it would result in greater participation and therefore a more accountable form of democratic politics. Direct democracy would come to supplant representative democracy. But this computational architecture, its open form, is not necessarily configured to provide an open political platform. As we know, some contemporary states exploit this fact in order to use the web as an extremely effective surveillance device. And all states who possess the means to do this surreptitiously engage in exactly the same behavior in the name of security. It remains the case, however, that the deep architecture of emergent hyperconnectivity militates against closure because the web in its technical and philosophical conception is without borders. At first pass, one might assume that this provides us with the means for changing the practice of politics from local to global, contingent to universal, from excluded to participatory. Those who advocate a theory of cosmopolitanism, for example, might find sustenance here. But what has become increasingly evident is that such analog formulations do not fit with the digital world we've created. This is because of the instable state of the platform. Its temporality is quantum. Or to put that another way, speed and scale become the metrics for time. Within such a state, it's very difficult to create and sustain coherence and consensus, the necessary components of democratic polities. Thus, in order to make progress, we need to attend to the modes or the functionalities of participation on the web and how they intersect with the one category without which politics as we know it would be eviscerated, agency. Although the virtual worlds on the digital platforms we've created provide many opportunities for playing, participating in locales of many sorts, and keeping our digital identities mobile or plastic, I think it's a mistake to understand this in terms of an analog definition of agency. In conclusion, I'm going to propose something from the other viewpoint, from the side of optimism. The migration of agency from the analog world in which it has a direct relation to effect and action to the digital in which it has a mediated relation alters agency itself. You can get a sense of this when you consider that we think of ourselves as actors or avatars in digital environments rather than as agents. We're quite comfortable with the notion that agency in emergent hyperconnectivity is distributed throughout and across the network within which it operates. This helps me identify my first building block of this hypothetical new ontology, distributed agency. The second 
is what I'm going to call algorithmic agency. This is not a speculative or hypothetical suggestion. Such agents already operate in increasing numbers and complexity across the platform of emergent hyperconnectivity. Let me sketch out to you briefly one such example. Many of you will be familiar with Netflix, the movie streaming platform that morphed from a physical DVD rental delivery system to an online provider of digital movie and TV content. The incredible success of the platform is created through the algorithms it employs to predict user by user content that is likely to be accessed, that is, viewed or watched. The algorithm, like all such statistical technologies, improves its success rate in direct relation to scale. And what is scaled is data. The genius of the platform is that it collects data on consumption, which here is watching the content, in real time. It has billions of data points on where, on when and where in a movie watching is interrupted, stopped, and then where and when watching resumes. Billions of data points on repeat viewing or exerted viewing. Billions of data points on what is viewed next to what. Billions of data points on which actors are likely to be popular with particular audiences and their social and political proclivities, choices in motor vehicle, the restaurants they like to eat in, and so forth. You can tell I'm getting hungry. From these data, an algorithm personalizes a profile or signature which enables it to predict what that person is likely to want to watch next. It creates a new agency, an algorithmic agency, that is not so much a proxy for me, but a new entity within the platform, here the platform of Netflix, and by extension, a new agency on the larger platform I've been outlining to you, the platform of emergent hyperconnectivity a new agent that has a remarkable set of features. Firstly, this agent is created from the totality of data which underpins the predictions of the algorithm. Its modus operandum is to engorge or suck up continuous data feeds, and on account of this, it needs, it requires, it cannot work without your participation. Now, Think of this in terms of politics and something quite extraordinary occurs. We've created a system that can only function through participation at the very largest scale and which works according to the principle of extensibility. This means that it can seamlessly scale up. What might this look like as a political system? Think of each and every data point every behavior that the platform registers as a vote, an expression or indication of preference. Think of these data points as citizens in a polis. But it's not you or me who does the voting here. It's a far more granular, micro, let's say quantumized me, boiled down into my viewing habits and proclivities who votes. And as the real me interacts with the platform, I sense that it is designed optimally for me, for my tastes and my needs. The genius of the algorithmic architecture of the system is that it feeds my self-satisfaction in order to keep me supplying what it wants, my data. But this feedback loop is not aimed or targeted at the real me at all, even though that is what I deeply feel to be the case. It is, in fact, trying to optimize the virtual algorithmic agent, the proxy for me that it has created. And the more I participate, the better my algorithmic proxy agent performs. What does this look like as a model for political agency? In the case of my example, it's important to understand that decisions within the Netflix pla platform are not made by humans. That's the mistake of analog thinking. Strange, though this of course seems to us, especially when we decide on a Friday night that we want to watch House of Cards, the algorithm creates solutions, for that is exactly what it's trying to do, that are emergent and to some degree unintelligible and certainly uninspectable to even the designer of the algorithm. 
In this scenario, the real me, through my participatory hyperconnectivity, assigns or deeds my agency to my algorithmic proxy, who is better even than I am at predicting what I would like to watch and when. It's a model of agency that optimizes agential behavior. An agent who is better at optimizing my desires and wants than I am. Now, I admit I'm about to sound like a Silicon Valley utopian gorged on excessive drafts of Kool-Aid, but let's push the envelope here and speculate on how this technology might optimize democratic polities. It would need to code for the optimization goals of the algorithm, but that in itself is child's play in programming terms. And since the algorithm works in an emergent environment, it would evolve its own, of its own accord, thereby creating refinements or new iterations of its goals as it operates. Isn't that exactly what politics is and does? And since the operation of the entity, the algorithmic agent, is optimized by participation at scale, it requires maximal input to the system. It requires us all to vote. So to conclude, I hope I've outlined clearly enough this new thing, a new political entity and a new ontology of politics. In the scenario I've given you, we're required to participate in the creation of a new me. We're required to participate in the creation of a new me that is not the summation or agglomeration of all of us, not a kind of additive democratic polis, but a new kind of political subject, the emergent entity I'm calling an algorithmic agent. That requirement is sometimes called the compliance protocol, which has been designed into the platform we've been investigating. You are about to obey it as you perform the rituals of participation the moment you reach to your communication device. This agent, in political terms, represents me to me and you to you, and at the same time, it represents everyone. Its ontology is a common, unshareable thing, a very unusual entity in that we have it in common, yet at the same time, it is unique to all of us, to me. Might we now have in our grasp an extraordinary opportunity? Might we be able to construct a politics of the many based upon a hyper-individualized entity that continuously evolves on account of its connection to every other entity in the polis, creating an unshareable commons? Might this be politics in the era of emergent hyper-connectivity? Let us hope that some public-spirited software engineers are working on it right now. Thank you.